Well, good morning. Oh, it feels so uh, wonderfully strange to be uh, back indoors and... Uh, So glad to see uh, so many of you. Last time I was preaching from this pulpit, uh, there were 12 people in here. And uh, while I love and appreciate uh, the 12 people showing up each week to uh, listen, it's so much nicer to have a whole, uh, well, I won't say sanctuary full, but at least a, a half of a sanctuary distantly spaced uh, to uh, be here and uh, to listen to uh, the message in person. Uh, we do also want to welcome people who are joining us online. We're still uh, streaming uh, to the internet as well, and so we want to welcome those people. You may see uh, people come in and out. We'll try to keep those distractions to a minimum, but we also want to uh, make sure that we welcome people who are joining online who couldn't be here in person this morning. Uh, a couple of uh, just announcements before we get into our time of worship. I um, uh, want to thank all of you for uh, working through uh, everything as far as just... Um, Trying to, uh, trying to navigate uh, the waters that are returning back and um, just uh, working through all the issues. We don't have everything down. We don't have all the kinks out yet, but we're doing our best to make sure that uh, we are able to keep everybody uh, safe and healthy and accommodate everybody in a way uh, that um, we're able to uh, worship the best we can, as distraction-free as we can, and yet stay um, as safe as we can uh, as well. On that note, uh, we just asked you uh, afterwards not to congregate in the back right there. I know that's a choke point for our church, even in non-pandemic times. It's typically uh, right back in that narrow hallway, so uh, if you need to, give give people a chance to move around. If there's um, uh, something you want to uh, uh, fellowship about, there is a, uh, of course, larger area over uh, in the gym, and hopefully the rain will be uh, done by the end, so we'll be able to uh, fellowship as well out on the steps, but just uh, watch that uh, back area uh, there. Uh, a couple of other announcements. Uh, please be in prayer for Lois Needler. Um, I don't think Lois is, I didn't, don't think I saw Lois here this morning, but um, most of you saw the email that went out this week about um, Chuck's passing. And um, if you could just be in prayer for her, we had a service uh, in here on Friday morning and uh, the gospel was uh, preached. Carl did a great job in um, exalting Jesus Christ and uh, Lois was uh, encouraged in that. We had a great time of remembering Chuck as well. But if you could just reach out to her in the days and weeks to come, um, I know this was a, a, a sudden loss for her and uh, will be a very difficult time for her as well. Wanted to also let you know uh, that um, we have decided to cancel the Bible conference for this year. Uh, we wrestled with it over a number of months, tried to figure out a way to uh, be able to, to, to still host it, but uh, with all the different factors of 2020, we decided just to put it off this year, and uh, this will be a year off. We'll look forward to getting back together, Lord willing, in 2021 uh, when we can have it uh, once again. And then finally, uh, just a reminder that um, there will be junior church this morning. You're welcome to keep your kids in here uh, for the service or to send them downstairs. And uh, Joel and Judy will be downstairs for the, uh, uh, for the junior church service. That will be during the uh, sermon. There won't be an announcement slide, but if you have kids, uh, when I get up to preach, you can send them down. That's ages four through uh, the third grade. All right, with that in mind, I'm going to ask Joel if he would to come and uh, open up our time with the reading of God's Word. Morning, beloved. Chapter 4 of Romans, please. Chapter 4 of Romans is our reading today. I'm going to read the first verse of chapter 5 also. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Not to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing, 
of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that the righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that, that do not exist. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake only, but for ours, us, ours only. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together, please. Oh, our Father, we just thank you for the privilege to come and worship thee. We pray, Father, that our worship will truly be done in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Father, even for the word that was just read. We thank you, Father, that it reminds us that you are a righteous, that you are a holy God, that you are a God who gives life to the dead, calls into existence the things that do not exist. Father, we acknowledge that man is sinful before thee, helpless. And even as we read that no self works on our behalf can save us. And only your righteousness is imputed to, to those by faith who believe in Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you for these truths that we read. Father, we also admit how our sin has separated us from you and, uh, and defiled even us as we go through our weeks. We just thank you, our Father, for, for the blessing of, uh, of the verse in, in 1 John that says if we confess our sins to you, Lord, that you are faithful uh, to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We admit, our Father, our great need for you, our need for salvation, our need, our need to walk by faith every day and every moment. We admit our need for physical and for spiritual healing, and we thank you, Father, we can come to you for that. We thank you, Father, for the access that we have even to your very throne of grace, Lord, where, where our great high priest is interceding on our behalf. And we thank you, Father, for, 
for grace and mercy that you can dispense even from your throne. Father, I pray, Father, for wisdom, how, how we all uh, can navigate even through these uncertain times and uncertain waters. And Lord, we thank you that, uh, that you have promised to give us wisdom if we ask of that in you in faith. I thank, that, I thank you that your word says that you are the God of all comfort and you're able to comfort all those who are in tribulation. And so, Lord, we ask you for your help, even on behalf of Lois and her family. We thank you, Father, for the promises that you made in your word concerning those who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that these promises may uphold her. We thank you, Father, for the gospel that went forth even to family members that were here. And, and, uh, and thank you that, that uh, the testimony of Chuck was proclaimed. We pray, Father, for boldness as we go about that you would just help us even to be aware of those who express a fear e even in these times. And Lord, help us, Lord, to express our hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and testify of your goodness to us. I pray, Father, that you would help us help our lights to shine even before men, Lord, that, that you can receive the glory through the th good things that are done. I pray, our Father, for those who lead us Pray especially for their salvation. Lord, Father, may they even understand their, their ineptitude and, and their, their helplessness even to lead without thee. And so I pray, Father, that you would just bring them to salvation and, and, and Father, that you give, give great wisdom as to how, how this country ought to proceed. Pray, Father, for your mercy and, and for your grace, even for, for the wedding that's going to occur this coming Saturday between Mark and Chloe. And so, Lord, we pray for your help even on their behalf as they prepare. Thank you, our Father, for, for your precious word. And even as it is dispensed to us, Lord, we pray that you would help us to have hearts that are sensitive, that are open even for your Holy Spirit to speak to us. We thank you that he can guide us into all truth, that he can power, empower us even to obey your word. And so, Lord, this we ask. Help us, Father, just not to be more intelligent in your word, but, Father, help us to be doers of your word. And I pray this, Lord. I think of our missionaries and thanking thee even for the email from the powers expressing how you've protected them. Father, how they've been able to run their camp and how people have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Thank you, Father, for these answers to prayer on, on behalf of these, our missionaries in France. Thank you. And so, Lord, now help us to glorify you even as we are modified, even in our singing, Lord. We can sing in our hearts even to thee. And, and Father, help us to make a, a sweet melody to you. Help us to worship you. In, uh, in our study of the word also, I pray for Pastor Kevin as he brings forth the message. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. Good morning. Usually this is the time I ask you to stand and let's sing, but we're going to be doing things a little differently this morning. I'm going to ask that you remain in your seats. The words will be on the screen and just uh, meditate on those and worship in your hearts as we sing this song this morning.
time of worship is going to continue as we listen attentively to God's word. And at this time, children going to children's church are dismissed. Well, those who uh, communicate for a living, uh, I would put myself in that category, pastors, but also teachers, uh, public speakers, etc., they'll tell you that there are several things uh, that they will do when they really want to get their point across uh, to someone. Uh, in fact, I think these things probably hold true as well uh, for parents who you might call uh, professional communicators as well. Uh, one thing people do is they talk really loud or uh, they may shout. Right, parents? This is an effective uh, way of getting your point across. Hey, do not do that. I told you don't do that, right? Um, another thing that people do to get their point across is uh, they use a lot of uh, hand motions and a lot of facial expressions. Um, in fact, you may have been frustrated over these past few months because you can't read facial expressions anymore, right? You go to the store, you can't tell if somebody's happy with you or angry with you. Um, it, it's really hard, but that's uh, something that uh, people do. They may say, don't you understand? You can see it in their face, right? You sometimes don't even have to have a, uh, a raised voice. You can just say, say it all with your eyes, right? Say it all with your hands. I said not to do that. But when people communicate by writing, when writing is the uh, communication of choice, uh, there's no options like these, right? You can't yell, you can't make hand motions, you can't show body language, uh, right? When uh, people are limited to writing, they have to do other things to emphasize a point. Now, young people might be thinking, right, that's why we have emojis, right? And that's why you have the all caps button, and um, that that might drive some of you crazy. Your parents or your grandparents write in all caps all the time. It's like streaming on the internet, right? Um, but uh, people have to do other things when it comes to writing, and um, in Bible times, they did not have the all caps button. Uh, in fact, little known uh, fact, uh, it was tip manuscripts were typically written in all caps or in all uh, lowercase letters, and of course, the emoji had not yet been uh, uh, invented. However, the Apostle Paul really wanted to emphasize a point, as we've been seeing, in Philippians chapter 3. So let's go back there and uh, turn with me in your Bibles there to Philippians chapter 3. So far, Paul has used two methods of communication to emphasize his point in the first seven verses uh, that we have been reading uh, over the past few weeks. If you would, follow along with me, and I'm going to uh, reread the first seven verses in order to catch us up to where we are today. Philippians 3, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless." But whatever, th but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. If you would, bow with me in a word of prayer as we uh, prepare to our, our hearts to approach the text this morning. Heavenly Father, we, uh, Lord, just want to pray that, um, Lord, as we study your word, Lord, um, that it would, uh, Lord, do uh, the work that you would have it to do on our hearts. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would now uh, illuminate our minds and would now convict our hearts, Lord, of the ways that we need to change. Lord, we pray that you would uh, help us to have uh, great understanding that would lead to, Lord, great applying of the word this week. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that uh, Paul does as he writes this passage that we've been studying over the past few weeks is to use uh, repetition 
uh, in order to emphasize his point. In verse 1, you remember he said, to write the same things to you, it's no trouble to me. It is safe for you. Paul had already warned the Philippians about these men that he was going to talk about. But to make his point, he says, uh, listen, I'm going to repeat myself. It's a help to you. It's no bother for me to do it. And so he repeats himself over and over. The second thing Paul used to stress his point here is strong language. We saw that in verse 2. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Paul was not writing in a roundabout sort of way. He wasn't beating around the bush. He didn't dance around the issue, but rather he called these false teachers exactly what they were. Dogs, evil workers, those who mutilate the flesh, or your, your translation might say the false circumcision. Paul used serious words for serious warnings. Then we saw Paul move on to another point that he wanted to strongly make, and that is that all of his accomplishments, everything that he had done, meant nothing to him anymore. And so in verse 7, he, he concluded by saying this, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Last time we were together, Paul made a strong statement about what he thought of his former achievements. That all of his gains had become losses, all of his positives had become negatives, all of his A's had become F's, all of his successes had turned into failures. Everything that Paul was and everything that he was proud of had suddenly become a loss because he realized that he had been trusting in those things in order to bring him righteousness. But in his characteristic way, Paul is now going to pull out these two tools of communication repetition, and strong language, to once again drive home his point once more in verses 8 through 11. Look at verse 8. Paul says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Once again, Paul is repeating what he said in verse 7, only this time with a stronger language. Repetition, strong language. But notice how much more intense he gets in verse 8 than he was in verse 7. Look at how he describes the nature of his change at salvation. First of all, look at his counting. There's something interesting here. In verse 7, Paul says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. He spoke in which tense? It was the past tense, right? Which most likely is him looking back at his conversion to when he had to relearn how to count. But now in verse 8, Paul doesn't say, I counted, but indeed I count. Present tense. For Paul, salvation was not a one-time renunciation of what he held dear. It wasn't a one-time event. For Paul, salvation was something that had lasting consequences and ongoing consequences for his entire life, from conversion, through his sanctification, and indeed on to his future glorification. And that's because salvation is the permanent altering of how a person looks at things in his or her life. The verb in verse 8 is a continu has a continuing aspect to it. It could say, indeed, I am counting everything as lost. Verse 7, I counted it all as, as lost when I saw Christ for who he really was, and now I am continuing to count those things as lost. And that's because the change in our life at salvation is, first of all, permanent. Okay, permanent. I'm going to give you three, three Ps about the change of our life. This isn't my only uh, uh, outline here, it's a little bit of an odd outline, but um, the first one here, the first point here is that the change in our life is permanent. We see this uh, in that it did not just change him at salvation, but rather it continually affected him. But the change in our life isn't just permanent, it's also, to use another P, permeating permeating as well. In verse 7, Paul talked about how his former achievements meant nothing to him anymore. Circumcision, his Jewish heritage, his tribal background, his cultural advantages, his religious upbringing, his self-made righteousness. But now, in verse 8, look at how Paul repeats and intensifies it. He says, indeed, I count everything, just in case you didn't get it in verse 7, everything that I had is a loss. 
Paul didn't stop at his former life. He says he now counts everything as a loss. Anything that could be considered a rival to Christ, he counted as a loss. And indeed, that's how it should be for us. Whatever was in Paul's life that competed for his allegiance with Jesus Christ, he considered that thing to be dangerous. And indeed, we should consider it the same way. The change in Paul's life at salvation was, first of all, permanent. I counted and am counting everything as loss. Secondly, it was permeating. Not only are my achievements a loss, but everything is a loss. And third, notice that the change was also profound. It was profound. Paul once again used repetition and strong language to drive home his point. And so he says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I might say it's a good thing that Paul counted all things as a loss because he indeed, if when you think about it, he lost all things. Repentance from his former life was no small step, but rather it was a radical step for him to take. But because Paul had true salvation, because he had a conversion that had a permanent, permeating, and profound impact on his life, he took radical steps to follow Jesus. Paul didn't say, well, you know, i got to find a way to sort of gently extract myself from this Pharisee group. You know, I have to figure out a way to do something so that I don't really make waves. He didn't say, you know, I don't want to cause any trouble, but maybe I was a bit misguided. I'll just kind of slip out the back door. No, when he was saved, it radically transformed him in such a way that he could have cared less about what he had to throw away in his position and in his power. When you see Christ truly for who he is and you realize what he is worth, nothing else will compare for you from that point forward. No sacrifice will be too big. And so when Paul was converted, he willingly walked away from it all. I think of the passage in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters, right? Now, of course, Jesus is talking about God and money, right? God and the things of this world. But really, there's a parallel here, isn't there? Paul knew that that was the case. He knew instinctively, I am not going to be able to serve two masters. I'm not going to be able to follow Christ the way that he is calling me to and yet keep one foot in the door. Turning to Christ often means suffering the loss of many things. And for Paul, it meant suffering the loss the loss of almost all things. But Paul didn't care because his transformation was profound. It was radical. There was no regret for Paul. We never see any disappointment in his letters of the things he left behind. It, indeed, on the contrary, he was happy to jettison all those other things. We see this when Paul writes, not only do I count all things as lost, not, not only do I throw them all away, but I count them but rubbish so that I might gain Christ. Again, Paul here not only repeats what he's saying, but he cranks up the intensity, doesn't he? He says, not only do I count these things as nothing, but as loss. Not only do I count them as loss, but I count them as scubula, as it says in the Greek. The word is here is not just rubbish. It, is primar it was primarily used to refer to dung or excrement. Uh, it, it also sometimes signified rotting food in the streets, uh, foul-smelling street garbage that was thrown to the dogs. Indeed, sometimes that's what uh, uh, people think that uh, Paul was perhaps referring to. Remember, he had called them the dogs before, right? They were the ones who uh, went from house to house eating the garbage. Well, he says, fine, take my garbage. That's what I consider it to be. But the word, like I said, was very strong. Indeed, he could not say it much stronger than this. This word, scubula, was a vulgarity in his day. I, I would not dare use the equivalent word in English, but it was Paul who said it and not me. 
but he used it because that's how passionately he felt about the things of this world getting in the way of him pursuing Christ and knowing Christ. For Paul, there was now only one thing in life that was really, truly worth anything. Verse 8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul's one goal was to know Christ Jesus, his Lord. And that ought to be the goal of every Christian as well. That ought to be the one overriding goal of all of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, to know Jesus Christ, my Lord. Sadly, though, Much of modern American Christianity has stripped all of the meaning out of this incredible phrase right here. Many people take knowing Christ and they whittle it down to as little as possible. To know Christ nowadays means to know the facts about him. Jesus was God. Jesus is God. He died on a cross. He paid the price for man's sins. He was resurrected from the dead. Many people believe that if they trust these things, then they know Christ. But you you can tell that that's not what Paul's talking about here, right? It's so much more than that. Paul's talking about something far greater because he says this is something of surpassing worth, something that's worth giving up my entire life for, something that's worth counting the rest of my accomplishments and achievements as trash. And that's because what Paul's talking about is having a real relationship with Jesus Christ, not just knowing about him. It's it's about an intimate knowledge of Jesus that you have when he is your Lord and when you have a personal relationship with him, not just a knowledge of him. Knowing Christ does not come from agreeing to the facts about who Jesus is. Knowing Christ means having the Holy Spirit open your eyes to who Jesus is in such a way that Jesus changes your whole outlook on life because you see his infinite worth and the infinite value of having a relationship with him. You see the privilege that it is to have him as your Lord. It, It changes from being something that you look at as a burden, something that you might have to do if you were to become a Christian, to now suddenly something that you value above all else. Because you realize that Christianity is not about do's and don'ts, rules and regulations, but is about having a right relationship with the Savior of the universe, the God of all creation. For Paul, Christ Jesus became Christ Jesus my Lord, the Lord for whom he would gratefully forfeit all things. You remember Jeremiah 9, we read it a few weeks ago. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me. Paul had learned that truth. Wisdom, might, and riches simply tend to get in the way of having a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Why? Because we're, we're tempted to pursue those other things instead. We're, we're tempted to put them higher on our priority list than they should be. We're tempted to value them more than they ought to be. We say, oh, I want to grow wise. Uh, I want to have a lot of power. I want to have riches. And what we do is we begin to idolize those things, and we take Christ out of the center, and we put those other things as first place in our life, and instead we pursue those things. Paul said, listen, I want one thing, and that is to know Christ Jesus, my Lord. Again, though, this morning, you might be here and you might agree to all the right facts about Jesus Christ. You might believe the right things, but you need to understand this. Unless you comprehend the surpassing value of really knowing Christ Jesus as your Lord, unless you realize that you can do nothing yourself to make yourself righteous, unless you come to the point where everything else becomes worthless in view of knowing him, then all of your understanding, all of your information, all of your uh, biblical knowledge, all of your agreement with the facts of the gospel will amount to nothing. In fact, 
It'll be less than worth less than nothing, less than worthless, because you'll have a wisdom about Christ that will tend to keep you from the one thing that matters the most, which is knowing Christ. Knowing Christ Jesus means more than knowing about him. Knowing the facts of the gospel never saved anyone. James says it like this, even the, de- even the demons believe, right? And they tremble. So we have to move beyond knowing the facts about Jesus and into having a personal, intimate, right relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. Now, what does it mean to have this relationship with Christ? We're not talking about some sort of spiritual kind of mysticism. I'm not, I'm not divorcing knowing Christ from knowing about Christ. You certainly have to know about him as well. But what does it mean to have this kind of relationship. Well, Paul goes on to define what it means to know Christ in verses 9 through 11. Look back there. In verse 8, he said, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but from that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The first thing that we see in verse 9 is that knowing Christ means being placed in him and being identified in him. Listen to how one author puts it. When we personally come to know Christ as Savior and Lord, we are placed what the Bible calls, in Christ, so that uh, all that is true of him because t- becomes true of us. In him, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. At the, at the instant we abandon trust in our own good works and put our trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, we are placed in him. God the Father views every believer through the merits of his Son. This standing or position before God is given to us through faith in what Christ did for us on the cross. Part of that position we inherit in Christ is a righteousness that is not of our own, derived from keeping the law, but the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. There are two ways to go about qualifying yourself for heaven, but only one will work. The way that never works is to try what Paul tried before his conversion, to attain righteousness of your own by attempting to keep God's law. It is an attempt to commend yourself to God by your own good deeds. The reason it cannot work is that it is always, at best, an external righteousness. It cannot deal with the corruption that is in every fallen, rebellious heart. It can never come close to keeping the spiritual nature of God's law, which is that we must love God with all our being and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. The other way, the only way to be right with God, is to receive the righteousness that comes from God through faith in Christ. And that faith puts us positionally in him. When you come to renounce your own uh, way of righteousness, your own way of earning merit with God, and instead, by faith, place all of your trust and your hope in Christ and his merits before God, then you are positionally in him. This is the crucial truth that verse 9 is talking about when it says that we might be found in him. But then verses 10 and 11 go even further in depth in what it means to know Christ. What, what Paul mentions in verse 8, he now returns to in more detail in verses 10 and 11. Whereas Paul merely stated his goal of knowing Christ in verse 8, he now explains what it means to know Christ in verses 10 and 11. And in these two verses, Paul gives us four phrases that draw a picture for us of what it means to know Christ. Knowing Christ means knowing the power of his resurrection, sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and trusting in him for your future resurrection. Let's break these down and look at these four things. The first thing Paul says is, to know Christ, to truly know him, we've got to know the power of his resurrection. You have to know the power of his resurrection. That is, to know Christ, we have to have experienced the power that comes to us as believers on the basis of his resurrection. 
What is the power of his resurrection? The power of his resurrection means that every believer has power for living the Christian life and is a power that is based on Christ's resurrection. Keep a finger here. Turn back just a couple of pages to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2 is one of the best pictures in Scripture of Christ's power, his resurrected power in our lives. Ephesians 2 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and the sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And, here it is, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our natural spiritual state is death. But then in verses 5 and 6, even when we were dead, God made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and he raised us up with him. One writer says, the power of Christ's resurrection means the living power that proceeds from the risen Savior and reveals itself in the believer by working a total renewal of life in him. Or turn back to Romans chapter 6 with me for a second. Romans chapter 6, and you're going to keep a finger here even after we move away from there. Because uh, we'll come back to Romans 6. Look at what Romans 6, 4 says that Christ's resurrection means for our manner of living. Paul says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Here, once again, is this correlation. Because Christ was raised, because he had a resurrection, therefore, we might walk in newness of life. Christ's resurrection doesn't just demonstrate his power over death, although it does that. It also allows us to live in the newness of life that he accomplished when he was raised from the dead. 2 Corinthians 5 puts it like this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a, a new creation or a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Or I think of uh, Colossians chapter uh, 2. Colossians chapter 2 speaks of the same thing. He says this in verses 12 and 13. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. The old self is gone. The new self is has been raised together because of Christ's resurrection, and now Christ has implanted this new man within us. Not a neutral man, but a man who is alive, who is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. To know the power of Christ's resurrection is to have a power that enables us to live in newness of life. It enables you to live differently each and every day, to walk differently than the world walks, to think differently than the world thinks, to act differently, to speak differently. You, you're not just commanded to do those things, but rather you are now empowered according to the Holy Spirit by the risen power of Christ to do these things. Will we be perfect? No. Will we struggle with sin? Absolutely. But the beauty of it is that because of Christ's power within us, we will be able to increasingly become like Christ. We won't be trapped in a cycle of defeat and despair and discouragement, but rather we will, three steps forward and two steps back, be growing in our sanctification and our Christ-likeness until that day when we are finally made fully like him in heaven in our glorified body. This is the difference between true believers 
and those who only claim to be believers. True believers have God's power to overcome sin. Those who only profess Christ with the mouth are indeed still dead in their sins and therefore will still end up walking according to the flesh. Those who profess Christ but then go back to their old lifestyle, well, the reality is that they've never really experienced the resurrection of uh, Christ and the power that it contains. And so the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus is found, first of all, in experiencing a life-transforming power of his resurrection that changes who you are and how you are in this very life. Secondly, knowing him means sharing in his sufferings, Paul says. Sharing in his sufferings. All all too often, we tend to talk to people (coughs) about what we might call the pretty parts of being a Christian, right? Right? It's all too easy to, uh, to do evangelism and, and just to mention the good parts, right? Because, I mean, after all, we want to see people saved, right? And so we're tempted sometimes to fail to mention the cost that comes with becoming a Christian. But Paul, he never left that part out. Time and time again, he reminds us of suffering that we may have to endure if we know Christ Jesus as our Lord. 1 Thessalonians 3, we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. Paul's even mentioned it in the book of Philippians. If you look back a page at chapter 1, at the end of chapter 1, verse 29 says, uh, I'm sorry, at the end of uh, chapter 1, he says, for, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Peter reiterates the same message. First Peter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. So that also, at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Scripture has a clear message for all who would come to know Jesus Christ. And that is that it means not only sharing in his life, but also sharing in his sufferings. Being a Christian means being willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. And the reality is that... uh, living in the free country that we do, it has meant that we have not had to suffer very much for Jesus Christ. But I can tell you this, that is not guaranteed to always be the case. And indeed, as we look to the future, we are not prophets, but we are uh, not, not going to be surprised if it does not remain that way for very long. We need to be ready to suffer for Jesus Christ. Third, Knowing Christ also means becoming like him in his death. Becoming like him in his death. For Paul, uh, this phrase no doubt had a past, present, and for him, the potential for future implications. In the past, Paul was conformed to his death at salvation. It it was self-identification with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ, he could write. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Or we look back to Romans chapter 6, if your finger's still there. Romans 6 is crucial to our understanding of what Paul is saying here. Look at the first seven verses. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin." Dying with Christ was not just some motto for Paul. Being conformed to his death at salvation instead had a decisive influence on his life, which leads to the present tense. Paul knew 
that dying with Christ wasn't just a one-time event at the moment that he uh, came to know Jesus Christ, but rather that it was an ongoing thing. He could say in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. In a very tangible way, Paul knew what it meant when, when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. That it wasn't just a one-time occasion, but rather it was being conformed to Christ's death in an ongoing way as we put sin to death and as we bear our cross in following Christ. The question is, can the same thing be said of us? Would someone say of you, her whole life, his, his whole life is dedicated, no matter what the cost, to being conformed to Christ's death. Can it be said, you know, he or she is willing to take up their cross and to follow Christ no matter what? This leads to the future sense then of this. Potentially in the future, Paul knew that he may have to make the ultimate sacrifice, and that is to give up his life for his Savior. Remember, Paul's writing the book of Philippians, not from uh, a, a nice little room. He's not uh, writing it from a uh, cushy little office, but rather he's writing it from a jail cell. Becoming like Christ in his death was a very real possibility as he wrote these words and as he wrote future letters down the line and indeed grew closer and closer to martyrdom. Fourth and finally, to know Christ means to trust in him for your future resurrection. To trust in him for your future resurrection. Why does Paul say that he's enduring so much? Why would he endure the, the pain, the trials, the beatings, the persecution, all the rest that he had to go through? Verse 11, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Commentator Gordon Fee says, conformity to Christ's death in the present which is possible for Paul because he also knows the power of Christ's resurrection in the present, will be followed by his own resurrection from the dead at the end. In other words, Christ's resurrection gives us life now so that we can be conformed to his death now so that we might one day be resurrected unto eternal life in eternity. Okay? Christ's resurrection gives us life so that we might be conformed to his death so that we might one day be resurrected unto eternal life. One note, though, about this phrase. Uh, literally in the Greek, Paul says, if somehow <clears throat> I may attain to the resurrection of the dead, and indeed some of your translations may say that as well. While that sounds as though Paul is doubting that he'll be resurrected, we know from other passages that this isn't the case. Uh, we think of 1 Corinthians 15, we think of 2 Corinthians 5, they make it obvious that Paul anxiously awaited his house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Why then would he say it like this? And it's likely for two reasons. First of all, Paul was sure that he would make it to the resurrection, but not how he would make it to the resurrection. Would Paul die? Would he be martyred in Rome? Would Christ return beforehand? Throughout Philippians, we see him uncertain of his fate. Secondly, it's also likely that Paul uses this type of language to remind the Philippians that participation in the resurrection is something in the future. By, by saying, if somehow, he guards against the idea that it's something that the believer already has in his pocket, so to speak, and therefore can be presumed upon. The Philippians should never stand, uh, should never stand in a cocky way thinking that they had already achieved it and neither should we. We ought to stand firm, be steadfast, and never lose our focus on our future in Jesus Christ, always seeking and striving to be pleasing to him in that last day. So then, with these four things in mind, what does it mean to know Christ? Listen, it is vital that you be able to answer this question today. Because when you think about it, there's nothing that's more important in this world. This is to be the goal of every Christian. If we summed it all up, we might say that it means living your life in light of the past, present, and future realities of the gospel. Isn't that what Paul's talking about here? 
It means living by grace through faith in the perfect life, substitutionary death, and life-giving resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ's death and resurrection have given us the power we need to live fruitful, God-honoring lives. His power gives us the ability and the joy of suffering for his sake. He enables us to take up our cross and to be conformed to his death, dying to sin so that we might look more like him each day. And finally, he gives us hope, the eager expectation that someday, after we've shared in this life and after we've shared in his suffering and after we've shared in his death, that we'll also share in the wonderful privilege of sharing in his resurrection. That is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that you can know him, not just about him, but really, truly know Christ Jesus as your Lord. My prayer is that you know him in this way, by God's grace, through faith, in Christ, and that it will make a real, tangible difference the way that you live your life in light of his death and his resurrection throughout this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for, um, Lord, the ability to know Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this gift by grace and that you have allowed us to receive it merely through the outstretched arms of faith and not through any uh, good works or any efforts that we need to do. We thank you, Lord, that it is all of grace, it is all of you, and that, Lord, we receive these things freely through the gospel. Heavenly Father, I pray that if there are any here, Lord, who have never come to know this gospel, never come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day that you open up their eyes to the marvelous realities of knowing Jesus Christ, that they would be willing to cast aside all the things that they trust in, all the things that they put their hope in, and that they would bank all of their trust in Christ and Christ alone, that they might know him and the power of his resurrection. Lord, I pray that as a church we would die to self and, Lord, that we would live in newness of life, Lord, even as you have given us the ability to, Lord, through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray these things. Amen. As we close, I want to meditate on the thought of God's righteousness and what Paul spoke of in that passage, of us having the righteousness of Christ that comes through faith.
Praise the Lord for the righteousness that is a gift of his to us uh, by his grace and through faith in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you've never come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never come to know the surpassing value, the worth of having a right relationship with God through him, uh, I would uh, urge you to find me after the service. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to sit down to answer any that you might have just to point you to the scriptures to how you might come to have this right relationship with Christ and to have the one thing that is worth more than anything else in this world, uh, the knowledge of Jesus Christ in having a relationship uh, with him. Well, just a reminder, we do have our two Sunday school classes that will be going on after this. Um, We're going to start them up at 1030 instead of 1045 since we have no canopies to tear down today. So uh, we praise uh, the Lord for that. Again, Joel's class will be in here. Bob's class will be in the Mariners area. Uh, but uh, that gives you about uh, 20 minutes or so of fellowship time. We just remind you uh, not to uh, congregate in the back, but allow that to um, uh, be a uh, uh, point for being able to walk uh, back and forth. And also, uh, don't forget the offering boxes are in the back. There's one over at the Welcome Center, one on this back shelf uh, right there um, as well. And uh, so um, we would just encourage you to continue to be faithful. uh, And we want to thank you for being faithful in giving to the Lord and sustaining the ministry of Ocean City Baptist Church. Um, It is a blessing, and uh, we are truly grateful to you and to the Lord for it. Well, let's uh, let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for, uh, Lord, the grace that you have given us through Jesus Christ, Lord. We thank you for the righteousness Uh, that is ours through him. We thank you that you have placed us in him, Lord, through uh, no merit of our own, Lord, through no efforts of our own, but Lord, rather uh, by your grace and uh, Lord, something that is received by our faith in him, Lord. Uh, Lord, may we live our lives in the light of his resurrection, Lord, putting to death the deeds of our flesh and being alive, Lord, to you instead this week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall I thank you for days of sunshine, yet grumble?